So thank you very much, all of you that joined uh, tonight for our program. Uh, my name is Felipe Moriel. I'm an assistant professor at the Branch Cattle Research and Education Center, working primarily with beef cattle nutrition. So today, obviously, we're going to do a little bit different than uh, we have been doing the past few years. We were, we were doing this meeting face-to-face -face in several counties throughout Florida. So unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we have to do it online, but hopefully everybody's safe at this point. So uh, today's presentation, uh, I'm going to focus on beef cattle nutrition, okay? And then we're going to have two speakers, myself and Dr. Binelli. Dr. Binelli is from University of Florida, and he is uh, uh, beef cattle specialist on reproduction, and uh, he will be sharing some of the data that he has collected over the past uh, few years, okay? So Dr. Binelli here is, is joining with us. Uh, so are you guys watching, seeing one or two uh, uh, slides? I believe you're seeing one, right? So today, uh, when we were discussing to organize this meeting, um, we obviously were asking sponsors to support a face-to-face -face meeting before the pandemic hits. And so even though we were not being able to do it uh, on face-to-face, -face, all those sponsors help us support this program and we hopefully will be able to do it again face-to-face -face next year. But I do have to thank a lot of people that help us in a lot of our programs. Uh, the first I would like to thank is the South Florida Beef and Forge program. This is a group of livestock agents and state faculty that focuses on South uh, Florida, but tremendous help for all of our programs. I'd like to thank them. Also like to thank the IFAS Extension Office, as well as all the support from McNess, Carg, Usoetis, and Multini. Right, this presentation has been, is gonna be recorded, and then we will share the presentation. It will be available for, for, v, uh, for future view for free at our uh, YouTube channel at the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center. So if you haven't visited our web, uh, the website and also our channel on YouTube, just search for the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center on Google or Facebook, and you will be able to find it. And we have not only the, these videos, but we're also gonna have information about every faculty at our center, some, and everything that is going on at the center this year. Okay, all the updates that we have. Now, because we're using an online format, I think it will be easy if we just uh, leave the questions for the end of each presentation. So please feel free to write down your, uh, enter your question here on the chat group. And then at the end, I'll be able to, to address each one of them uh, at the end of the presentation, okay? So, and if needed, we can unmute uh, the participants and then just um, create a discussion if needed, okay? So this presentation will be quite informal and, and I hope that this format will make it easy for everybody to feel more welcome, okay? So, like I said, the first part, I'm gonna focus on supplementing beef females. I divided the whole presentation in two parts. The first part, I'm gonna focus on uh, nutrition of mature cows and some of the data that we have collected. And then the second part, I'm gonna focus on replacement heifers. Some of these data you guys probably have already seen, but uh, every year we update the data, we collect more and more results, and then we're being able to update and, and make some slight changes to our conclusion, okay? So the first part, like I said, we'll focus on multiple counts. I'm gonna show you, talk a little about reproduction, also fetal programming. And unfortunately, for, for several years, uh, People had this preconception that uh, nutrition of mature cows uh, had to be the cheapest one. We should always focus on giving the, the, the least amount of nutrients, the cheapest diet as possible to this group because we, we only had to make sure that they have a good body condition score. And then lately, and with this presentation, hopefully I'll be able to change your mind without, about that. I believe that in my opinion, these cows are, should probably have the, probably the best diet in the whole cow calf system because these cows not only will get pregnant better have better reproductive performance but it will also improve the quality of the calf that we are producing okay and i'm show you i'm going to show you these results that we have in the first part of the presentation i also want to point out that we do have some challenges and the challenge is that uh, some of the best management practices in terms of cow performance is not the strategy that leads to the best performance in the calves so we should account for what's gonna happen with the performance of both of those animals to decide what, what is the best 
nutritional strategy to, to, to select, okay? But, and I also wanted you to make you aware of it that despite the importance of this topic of nutritional beef females in primarily fetal programming, the amount of data regard, uh, relative to the importance of this uh, topic is very limited. And hopefully we will slowly change that mindset and, and add more and more data throughout the years, all right? So we know about the importance of body condition score in mature cows. Every time we talk about nutrition of, of mature cows, we do have to talk about body condition score. And then for years, we do know that in uh, situations where we have natural breeding, body condition score at the time of calving is highly important to determine the pregnancy rates. So it doesn't matter the breed, doesn't matter the location, as you increase the body condition score at the time of calving, we have a substantial increase on pregnancy rates. And this we know for a lot of years right now, this is nothing new. We also know that body condition score at the time of calving also determines when that pregnancy will happen. So cows that have a better body condition score, as a five, six, or seven, they do resume estrus sooner, which means that those cows are able to cycle sooner, then they ovulate sooner, and we should be able to get them bred early in the breeding season, which is extremely important as they are gonna have more time to recover before the next breeding season, and they also will wean an older calf, which uh, overall usually is gonna be also heavier at the time of weaning. And I believe that Dr. Vinel will show a lot of that data, the importance of early calving and early breeding um, to a cow calf system. But those two slides that I just showed you, we know a lot. But even in a scenario where you do utilize estrogen synchronization, so you use exogenous hormones to induce puberty or to induce ovulation, we know that body condition score is important even in those situations, right? Even when you assist in the reproductive system of that count, use body condition score is still highly important. So this data was generated in Brazil. They do a lot of our efficient simulation there. And the, this is the uh, conception rates to the first AI. So how many cows were pregnant on the first day of the breeding season, depending on how well they calved. Okay, so for example, you have cows that calved on body condition score six or higher, five or five and a half, or cows that calved on body condition score lower than the optimal, so lower than four and a half. Okay, so in a scale of one to nine. So obviously what we can see here is that cows that have in body conditions for five or six and greater, they have greater conception rates than those that have in a lower condition score. Okay, so again, this is just the first conception rate, it's not the final pregnancy rate. But in this case here, you have almost 50% of your animals bred on the first day of the breeding season, right? And then this is almost 20, 25% more then uh, the, if you increase their body condition score compared to those that have in a light condition. Okay, so even if you try to help those cows by doing estrogen synchronization, body condition score is still important. This data is for first calf cows, but they, what they did, what they also looked at, what happened to conception rates after, uh, uh, if you also account for what happened to those cows after calf, all right, so for example, here they broke down these groups of cows into those that kept in high body condition score, but they maintain or they lost condition after uh, calving, right? And then here you have moderate cows, cows that kept in body condition score five or five and a half, and they either gain, maintain, or lost body condition score. And finally, you have those cows that kept in a very thin body condition score, and they either gain or maintain. So we could spend the whole presentation, the whole night, just using this table, we're talking a lot about nutrition and reproduction, but the overall message here is that regardless of their body condition score at the time of calving, obviously if they gain or maintain body condition score after calving, they have better conception rates than those that lost, okay? Another important factor here is that if they calve in a low body condition score, even if you make them gain body condition score, right, after calving. So let's say they calve very thin and you made them gain throughout the entire breeding season. Their conception rate was never as high as those that calve in good condition and they maintain. So what that means is, even though you were able to improve the conception rates by making those cows gain body condition score after calving, if they have calved in a very thin body condition score, there's not much you can do. You will never fully compensate for that. So the, the, the main two messages here in this slide is that 
pre-calving body condition score is the most important factor that we should focus on. And then after that, we should do everything we can to either maintain or gain body condition score on those scales. At least minimize as much as we can how much body condition score those scales will lose. Now, this data was with first calf cows. Uh, we also have the same type of data with multiple scales. And the, the message, the overall message is exactly the same. The only difference is that the magnitude of differences between those groups is slightly less than with for first calf cows. But still, well, the, the whole message is cows that have in good condition, they have uh, greater conception rates, especially if they maintain or gain body condition score after calving, right? Now, just that is now everything that I talked about body condition score, and you guys probably already knew all of this, okay? And the whole focus in those first uh, few slides was just the reproductive performance of the cows. But now we do have a tool that I hope that producers will be able to explore more often. And this is what we call the fetal programming. And, and that's why I like this area so much because it has implications to the whole beef industry. This is the concept that the, by changing the nutrition of this cow during gestation, you can affect how the tissues and organs of this calf develop during the gestation period. And that will determine how healthy they are after birth. Also, it will determine uh, the reproductive performance of the heifers and carcass quality of the steers. So we have a lot of implication about this area. So it's not just getting those cows calving in a good condition and getting them bred, but also the quality of the calf they were delivering. Okay, so as we go further into this topic, this is just a figure to show you how things work, okay? So here you have the first trimester, the second and the third trimester of gestation. And the red line is the growth of that calf in terms of pounds. So what we can see here is that two thirds of that calf growth happens during the last three months of gestation. For that reason, people thought that the only time that really matters was here, okay? When you're thinking about nutrition of a pregnant cow because the majority of the calf growth happened here. Uh, and also because the nutritional requirement for the pregnancy during the first two thirds, uh, uh, the two trimesters of gestation uh, is very minimal or nearly zero. People thought it was not really important, but now we know that that's not really true. The first trimester of gestation, for example, you have the formation of the majority of the visceral organs. So for example, ovaries are formed within 28 days of conception. A room and pancreas, kidney, liver, adrenal glands, which are the glands that will be responsible for determining the magnitude of the inflammatory response or the stress response that those halves will have later in life. And also testicles are formed within the first few days after conception. Of course, those organs, they continue to grow throughout the gestation and throughout the life of the, this animal. But the majority of the cell differentiation and how they're going to establish is happening during the first few days. So even though the requirement is very low, by changing the nutritional, uh, the, the nutrition of this cow, you can change the environment in the placenta and change how these cells are gonna uh, form. Okay, not only the formation of organs, but also DNA methylation, epigenetics, all kinds of me mechanisms that we don't need to cover tonight. Another point that I wanna make to you is that we, if we just leave the visceral organs aside and think about productive tissues, like for example, muscle and adipose tissue, you have muscle being formed primarily during mid gestation and late gestation, okay? And then adipose tissue is forming primarily during late gestation. What's unique about muscle tissue, and that's why gestation is so crucial for the future performance of those calves, is that muscle tissue grows in two ways. You can increase the number of fibers or increase the size of each fiber. The number of fibers is set at birth, which means that once the calf is born, the number of fibers will never increase anymore. The only way that the tissue, the muscle mass will increase in size is by increasing the size of each fiber. So for example, if you have a, a nutrient restriction that is severe enough to reduce the number of fibers being formed during mid gestation, right, it's very likely that this calf after birth will not be able to compensate for that. He can increase the size of each of those fibers, but depending on how much how severely he was affected during mid gestation, he might never had a chance to fully compensate for that. And therefore his growth is gonna be limited. It was never gonna be optimal. So the nutrition during gestation is crucial for the muscle uh, mass and muscle tissue and how this calf will perform in the future. 
the first message that I want to show you with this slide is that each organ or each tissue has a different timeline, has a different timeline of development or a different uh, window of development. So for example, visceral organs are during early gestation, muscle is set, uh, mid and late gestation, and adipose tissue, which would be responsible for marbling scores, are formed primarily during late gestation. So depending on when you apply a nutrient restriction, the outcome to the cat is going to be totally different. All right, and so we should be able to explore this. The ultimate goal of these research studies with fetal programming is to be able to tell a producer that depending on its, his goals or her goals, we will target different periods of gestation. All right, so for example, let's say we have a producer that doesn't really, is not really concerned about carcass quality. He wants to increase winning weights. Our goal is to be able to tell you one point as we generate more data to say, just focus on mid gestation, just focus on late gestation period. Or if you have a situation where you want to increase carcass weights and carcass quality, that's we, we, our hope is that we're going to be able to find strategies that we could focus only during late gestation. All right? So we should take advantage of the fact that each organ is developing at a different time and use that as an our advantage to increase the carcass quality and increase the, the, the performance of the cancer. The other point that I want to make here is that every tissue has a different priority for nutrients. So what that means is uh, all muscle and adipose tissue, they have the last priority. So when you have a nutrient restriction, they are the first ones to suffer, right? All the nutrients are going to be spared and shift and partition away for organ, for the visceral organs, brain, pancreas, liver, for the fetus. And then whatever is left, if there's a deficit, the muscle and adipose tissue will be the ones, the first ones to suffer. So that's why a lot of the data that I'm gonna show you is that when we boost the performance of those cows during this period here, during late gestation, in cases that they are experiencing, uh, experiencing a nutrient deficiency, we have a tremendous boost in calf weaning weights and also carcass quality. Okay, so let me give you some example. These are the studies that have been done for a while. They are the, I, I like to show them because they really started this whole movement about beef cattle, fetal programming in beef cattle uh, several years ago, okay? So this study, they, have, they did a very simple um, design. They had you know, three studies, they did exactly the same thing. They had a group of cows that received and a group of cows that did not receive one pound of a protein supplement for the last trimester of gestation, okay? And then they follow, and then after that, all cows were treated exactly the same, and they look at, uh, investigated the performance of the steers. So what they did, what they found was that the calves that are born from cows that received the protein supplementation, they were heavier at weaning in three of those three studies. Two of them, they had greater carcass weights at slaughter, and they also had, one of them, they had greater percentage of carcasses grading choice and greater marbling scores. All right, so remember that figure that I showed you at the beginning, that muscle tissue is formed primarily during late gestation, and also adipose tissue is formed primarily during late gestation. A very inexpensive supplementation strategy, one pound for about 90 days, it's a very small amount, was able to have substantial impact on their winning performance, carcass weight, and carcass quality. All right, so we should take advantage of that. Now, what happened to the heifers? The heifers that were born from the same cows in those studies, very similar outcomes. Uh, heifers that were born from cows that received supplementation, they were heavier at weaning. Uh, those heifers, they achieved puberty sooner. Those heifers that were born from cows that received the supplementation, they had greater pregnancy rates. And not only that, you had more heifers getting pregnant at the first 21 days of the calving season. And we're gonna talk more about the importance of that. So, here in this case, a very inexpensive amount of supplementation had a tremendous impact on wean weights and pregnancy rates of those heifers and calving distribution of those heifers, all right? At this point, we do not know, we're not capable of saying that if they are achieving puberty sooner just because they are heavier or if there's a fetal programming effect improving their reproductive performance. But in terms of when we think about real world, we, we care about pregnancy rates and, uh, the income that we're going to have, uh, this tells you a lot, right? So we should take advantage of this type of surgery. But these studies that I just showed you, they were done with both Stavros animals, English breeds in North, uh, in West, Mid, I'm sorry, Midwest United States. What I'm going to show you, uh, the focus of our group 
from now on is to look at how does the calves uh, in a subtropical environment, towns that have bosinicus influence, right? Some, some three eighths or a quarter of it, uh, of their genetics is from Brahma. In, the, in these cows, this psychogenetics and also our environment, with hot and humidity and low quality pastures, has a lot of mass, but very low quality pastures. And all the chances that we have in subtropical environments, do they respond the same way or not, right? Now, one question that we always have, always get from people is, what's the most important gestational period that I should focus on? And I hope that just by showing this data to you, you should be able to answer that already, right? It depends on your objective. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to increase winning weights, most likely we're going to focus on mid and late gestation. If you want to increase carcass weights and carcass quality, we should focus on uh, during late gestation. So it really depends on what you want to do. Another factor that will determine what's the most critical moment is where we are, right? Or not only the location, but how we're managing our herds. Where is the period that we're gonna have the highest deficiency of nutrients? And that varies a lot. It varies from state to state. It varies from North Florida to South Florida, the degree of, of, of dryness and then the winter and then how much nutrient restriction we have. And even, even if you consider the same county, right? Two producers are neighbors, right? One person does a very uh, overgraze their pastures and another one has a very good management of their pastures. Obviously, the periods where they, we're going to experience this deficiency uh, during gestation is going to be totally different between those two places. So there are a lot of factors that will influence and, 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 and that we have to take into account to determine what is the most uh, critical period. So my answer to that is depends. We have to design a nutritional program specific to you that addresses your needs, your type of management, your location, and, and, and your objectives to design which one is best for you, okay? Now, another major point that I wanna show you today is that those fetal programming effects do not necessarily happen only on thin cows. And we do see an improvement on calf performance regardless of the body condition score of cows. So even if they are in good condition, I'm gonna show you that some of these strategies can also lead to a better performance of the calves, right? To the point that it will pay for the investment, all right? So this is a study that was done by Dr. Cook in, in Oregon, and now Dr. Cook is a professor at Texas A&M University, and Dr. Marcus is a professor at Montana State University, it was his PhD at this time. So we did this study in collaborations uh, a few years ago where we wanted to look at body condition score and also uh, nutritional status during gestation and how does that affect the performance of the cows. So here we have a group of cows that they were fed to maintain a high body condition score for the entire gestation, okay, and for the entire study. A second group that was fed to maintain a low body condition score around four and a half for the entire gestation period. And then we added a third group that counts gain condition during the first trimester. So they start thin, they gain condition during the first three months, and then they were fed to maintain these high conditions score until calving. And then we have a second group, a uh, uh, fourth group, I'm sorry, that increase their body condition score during uh, the second trimester of gestation and then fed to maintain high condition for the rest of the study and a third group that only increased condition score during the last trimester. So you had here all possible combinations, uh, counts that maintain high all the time, low all the time, or counts that gain condition during the first, the second, and third trimester of gestation. So what happened here? In terms of cow performance, we didn't see any differences in their uh, uh, reproductive performance or milk production or birth weights of the calves. But look at the pre-weaning average daily gain in weaning weights of those calves. The best results was from calves that were born from cows that gained condition score during mid and late gestation compared to all other treatments. All right, so remember that figure I showed you at the beginning? Muscle tissue again is formed primarily during mid and late gestation. So those cows that gained condition during those stages, they were able to increase their weaning weights, the weaning weights of their calves, without having any effect on their milk production. So this is purely the calf being either more efficient or they have greater capacity to put more uh, muscle tissue. 
And we did not see that effect, even though they gained the same amount of condition score if that happened during early gestation. And that was expected, right? We remember that during early gestation, we have primarily the visceral organs being formed. Now, the major, another message that I want you to be aware of, look at the weaning weights of those calves that were born from cows that calve in low condition and those that calve in great condition. I'm sorry, here. They're exactly the same. No statistical differences. What that means is that it is not the body condition score of those counts that improve the performance of the calves. It's the actual having them gain condition during gestation, primarily during mid and late gestation that results in a better performance of those calves. We, in this study, we were not able to send those calves to the slaughter to look at their carcass quality. But if you do extrapolate that figure I showed you at the beginning, right? It's very likely that the calves with the greater uh, carcass quality will be these ones here that were born from cows that gained condition during the gestation. Okay, so, but this is just a speculation. I'm just uh, using the theory to try to predict what's going to happen. We need to replicate this study, but the main message here is that it's not the actual body condition score, it's the fact that they gain condition during the gestation. So, that's a great message because even if you have cows in good condition, we could use a supplementation strategy, small amount, just to make them gain, and maybe we will harvest better performance on those counts too. Now, in Florida, if you think about our challenges and uh, our uh, climate and, and how most of the producers um, have their breeding seasons uh, spread throughout the year, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, during the winter time, what we have here is that uh, this is a, a figure of our nutrient requirements of counts that are calving in November, okay, and weaning their calves around May and June, right? The, the, the blue dashed line is the requirements of protein. The orange dashed line is the requirements of energy. And then the solid blue line uh, is the amount of protein in the Bahia grass, and the green line, and the orange solid line is the amount of energy in the Bahia grass, right, TDN. So clearly what we can see here is that we have two periods of deficiency, in a period of surplus where the amount of protein and energy in the, on grass is much higher than the requirements of those cows. And obviously their requirements is much greater after calving, right, because of lactation and because we're a weaner and that this is the lowest quality of, of behaviors we're gonna have throughout the entire year. But this is a period that not a lot of, a lot of people are aware of. So starting in October, even though we have plenty of grass, the amount of protein and energy on that grass is slightly lower than their requirements. So those cows, as I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, they start losing condition about 45 to 60 days before calving. It's a small loss that sometimes you don't notice unless you're, you're measuring like frequently, but it's enough to have a, an effect on the performance of the calves, all right? So all of the data that I'm going to show you for the rest of the presentation this far is regarding late gestation. Okay, we're focusing on that time because I believe this is where the majority of the producers will have a, 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 an opportunity to, to improve the performance of the calves. So the first study that I want to show you was funded by the Florida uh, Ketamine Enhancement Board. Um, and I really appreciate their support. It was a two-year study. It's for my PhD student, Elizabeth Palmer. She's here. Uh, in the audience watching this presentation. So uh, I should actually ask her to give this, talk about these slides. Uh, but this is a very simple design, okay? So we had a group of cows that did not receive any pre-calving supplementation, which is what most people do. And then we added a second treatment that receives about two pounds of distiller's grains for the last 84 days of gestation. All right, very similar to the other studies that I just showed you at the beginning. And then we added a third treatment that instead of doing two pounds per day for the entire legislation period, we concentrated all of the supplement during the first half of the legislation period. So we provided four pounds for half of that time. The idea for that treatment was try to be more cost effective. So our goal was to concentrate all of the supplementation during the first half. Therefore, our labor costs decreased by half. Uh, and also during a time that their nutrient requirements are, are the lowest. So in theory, that was a hypothesis that those cows would add more body condition score with the same amount of investment that we are uh, uh, putting into those cows. And we're also reducing labor by half. 
Now, by doing this, by thinking about in terms of labor and trying to uh, save uh, some, some uh, a small amount of feed costs, what is going to happen to their reproductive performance and what is going to happen to the performance of the calves? Now, after calving, everybody is, is managed exactly the same. They are on pastures, bahia grass, and also they're offered to, of free choice access to hay and about four pounds of molasses and urea supplementation. So the only differences between among those three groups is how we fed them before calving. So what we see was in terms of body condition score, here we have the body condition, the average for the, uh, the past two years. So the study started in August, about three weeks after we weaned the calves. Uh, and then the calving occurred from November, uh, starting in November, bringing season from January to April and prep checked in May. So at the start of the study, those cows, of course, they have the same amount of body condition score. But look at the time of calving. Again, obviously, the cows that receive supplementation, they kept in much better condition score. Now, look at here, this control group that I told you before. They are losing body condition score in the last 45 days, even though we have plenty of grass, right? So, but if we provide a supplementation, we were able to revert that, right? And so now cows are gaining condition score throughout the entire legislation period. But we did not see any differences between those that were supplemented two pounds for 84 days and those that were supplemented four pounds for just half of the time. So if you think about that, if you think about body condition score, which strategy would you pick? Well, probably this one that we only fed for half of the time and we reduced labor by half, and we still achieved uh, one of the highest body condition score at the time of calving. Now, after calving, those cows that received free calving supplementation, they were able to maintain this higher body condition score throughout the entire breeding season. However, even though they had greater body condition score, we did not see any differences on their pregnancy rates, which it's disappointing, but it's not that surprising, right? So we just need to look at the data more closely. So the reason that we didn't have any differences in pregnancy rates is because even though the control group lost condition score before calving, they still kept in a body condition score of five. And after calving, their body condition score loss was less than a half point. So the control group did not need supplementation. So the impact of free calving supplementation in this situation here uh, did not show up in their reproductive performance because the cows actually did not need it, right? They started the studying good condition, calving in good condition, and had minimal body condition score loss. So the investment in pre-calving supplementation, if we just look on the cow side, was useless. We just wasted money. Now let's look what happened to the calves. So one of the questions that we also had is, when we supplement cows during pre-calving, do we increase their birth weights? You can, and it actually we ha it happened in, uh, in this study here for two years. Calves that were born from cows that received supplementation pre-calving, they had greater uh, birth body weight, okay? They were heavier than those that were born from cows that did not receive supplementation. So, but even though they were heavier at the time of birth, right, uh, slightly uh, heavier, it did not affect the percentage of calves that are born alive. So even though they were heavier, it was not a problem for us. It didn't create calving uh, issues, all right? So, and we're collecting data every year, and so far we have done five or six studies over, uh, replicated for several years during the past five years, and we have never had any problems with uh, uh, calving difficulty by doing this supplementation strategy, okay? But we always keeping the supplementation during the pre-calving period around two to four pounds, no more than that. I cannot tell you if there will be a problem if we feed more than that. I don't have that data yet to share with you. But if we keep it around for two to four pounds, we have never had any problems so far. Now, what about weaning weights? So look at nine months of age, the weaning weights of those calves. Calves that are born from cows that received supplementation before calving. They are much heavier at the time of weaning compared to the control group. Calves that were born from cows that did not receive supplementation. But now the best results were for calves that were born from cows that were offered supplementation for the entire late gestation period. All right, so about 30 pounds more than the control. Those that were born from cows that were supplemented only during the first half of the late gestation period, they were also heavier at weaning, but they did not, they were not able to achieve the the 
as as a great uh, as great performance as those that were born from cows that were offered supplementation for an entire legislation. So what that tells you is that the best strategy for the mom did not result in the best performance in the calves. And this difference here in winning weights for this group that was uh, that were supplemented for the entire legislation period uh, is more than enough to pay for the cost of the supplementation. So even though we did not see any differences on pregnancy rates of the cows, just the additional winning weights of those calves paid for the cost of supplementation. Now we did send those calves to, to the feedlot uh, to look at their performance in the feedlot and carcass quality. This is just the data from year one. And what we saw was the calves, as you would expect, calves that are born from cows that received supplementation during the legislation. Okay, regardless if it was for the entire legislation or just the first half, they tended to have greater carcasses, uh, greater percentage of carcasses grading choice. Right? So for, for a producer that is planning on retaining ownership of those calves, this type of strategy could be used even in our uh, situation, in our environment with our challenges to improve the carcass quality of those calves. Okay. Now, you do not necessarily need to use the dry distiller's grains. I know right now it's very difficult to find the type of supplement. Uh, you can actually use molasses and have similar results. So in this study, here's a two-year study that we just published in the Journal of Animal Science. It's uh, for pregnant replacement heifers that they were fed, uh, they were offered no pre-calving no pre supplementation or about two pounds of molasses in urea supplement or molasses in urea supplement fortified with methionine, right, which is an essential amino acid for grazing animals. And also has indications that uh, methionine could change the epigenetics of calves. A lot of data on, on dairy cattle. So we wanted to look here is if molasses could also lead to those results. And if we fortified that supplement with molasses, would we be able to boost those effects as well? After, and, and these supplements, they were provided for about 56 days pre-calving and about uh, 18 days after calving, okay? 18 days after calving, everybody's gonna is managed exactly the same. Everybody received molasses with urea and no, uh, nobody receiving methionine, okay? Everybody managed on the same type of pastures, same amount of supplementation. So the only difference is how we fed them during the pre-calving period. So what we, and then after calf, what we do here at ONA is that we early wean all the calves from our first calf counts. Because this is a strategy that increased their pregnancy rates substantially. So what we did, we early wean those calves at around 90 days of age. And then we put them in a feedlot and we fed them a high concentrate diet at 3% of their body weight. We really wanted to challenge those animals to gain as much as they could. And everybody fed the same diet, the same amount and percentage of their body weight. And then we also challenged those calves during the feedlot period uh, with two rounds of vaccination to boost, uh, to cause a, an immunological challenge, okay? And then see how did they differ in terms of vaccine response. So what we saw in terms of cow performance, as you would predict, again, uh, cows that receive supplementation, they do have a greater body condition score at the time of calving compared to those that did not receive supplementation. We didn't see any benefit of adding methionine to the diet of those first calf cows. And we also didn't see any statistical differences on their pregnancy rates. And again, the reason again is because they kept an excellent body condition score, even though they did not receive supplementation before calf. Now what happened to their calves? So the calves, they were, we, the, the, after they were early weaning, we put them in the field, all like I told you. And when we look at their overall performance, we see that again, calves that are born from cows that receive supplementation, they do have greater performances in average daily gain compared to those born from cows that did not receive supplementation. And in this study here, we didn't see any benefits of the methionine addition. Now, does that mean that adding methionine to supplements doesn't work? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that this study at this moment of gestation and the amount that was used did not elicit any further improvements on their performance. We need to replicate this type of data in other situations. So for example, we just published another study where we look at uh, feeding diets that have a high, uh, they're rich in uh, methionine concentration during early gestation. And then we look at uh, what happened to the calves. And in that scenario, we did see an improvement in the performance of the calves when we increase the amount of methionine being offered during early gestation, not final. 
So we don't have enough data to make a conclusion. I can just tell you that that particular source at that amount during this time didn't work, but we need to investigate more and, 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 and look at different scenarios. But the message here, another message is that you don't necessarily need to provide distillers grains, even molasses with urea, which is widely available in Florida, uh, liquid molasses in urea is able to have a uh, quite similar result. Now, something that we're measuring on our study, and then if we, it's something that we see that is quite consistent, is in terms of the effects of the own immunity. So several years ago, this study was released showing that calves that are born from cows that received one pound of a protein supplement during late gestation, 10 times less calves develop bovine respiratory disease uh, once they were sent to a commercial feedlot. So think about the cost savings here that you have uh, with, if you have 10 times less calves being treated against bovine respiratory disease, being, having to pull less calves from the pens, and also the, the impact of bovine respiratory disease, disease on their carcass quality. So the cost savings here is more than enough to pay for the investment of pre-calving supplementation. And a data that we have generated in several of our studies that helps to explain these results is this one here. We noticed that calves that are born from cows that receive supplementation, okay, in several of our scenarios, this, this doesn't matter the, 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 the supplement, more calves are responding positively to the vaccination when they are born from cows that receive supplementation compared to those born from unsupplemented cows. Even though in the majority of those studies, all cows had, were in great condition at this point. So somehow the better pre-calving nutrition is uh, improving their uh, immunological response. So more calves respond to the vaccine. So just to give you uh, an example, uh, this is a serum, the amount of calves that responded to vaccination against bovine uh, virus, the urea virus one, which is one of the main pathogens that causes the respiratory disease. 84% of those calves produce enough antibody to, so that we can assume that they're protected and only 56% of those calves that were born from cows that did not receive supplementation responded. That means that 44% of your calves, we just wasted two rounds of vaccine, they never produced any antibody against bovine uh, via the urea virus, all right? This is something that we are seeing in our study that's very, quite consistent. Now, another study uh, to finalize the, the fetal programming uh, part is, Fetal programming is also an opportunity for us to test feed additives. It's not just protein and energy. We could include some of the uh, FDA approved uh, feed additives that is widely used in the beef cattle industry to see what's the impact on the performance of the cows. So this is a study that we did for one year. Unfortunately, uh, we were gonna replicate them this year, but unfortunately we had to cancel that, which is a shame because as you guys are gonna see, there are great results. But hopefully we'll be able to do it next year. So this study here, we had 160 Brangus cows that were on Bahia grass pastures, and they were offered no pre-calving supplementation or two pounds of distiller's grains for the last 70 days of gestation. And then a third group where we fortified that supplement with monensin, about 200 milligrams of monensin per cow per day, right? Which is the rumenzine product that people use uh, widely. Okay, so the only difference here is how we we fed them pre-calving, and the idea was that the addition of monensin could probably boost some of these fetal programming uh, effects. And then after calving, everybody's managed exactly the same, okay? No differences in how supplementation, grazing, or, or anything. So what we see, what we saw was in year one, is that body condition score, okay, again, we started the study around mid-August, end of August, calving in November, bringing season in January, weaning the calves in the next July. And we start the study in the same condition, everybody. Again, whoever received supplementation, kept in better condition score. But now this study here, the control group, again, losing condition in the last 45 days, 40 to 45 days. But this time they kept in a body condition score lower than the optimal that we always recommend. The other study that I showed you that we didn't see any differences on pregnancy rates was because they lost condition score, but they still kept in better condition. And above five. In this scenario, no, they kept in lower, okay? But we didn't see any effects on monensin in terms of body condition score of those cows until calving. Now, after calving, those that received supplementation, they were able to maintain this high condition score 
compared to those cows that did not receive supplementation before calving. And somehow these cows that received monensin pre-calving, even though they're not offered monensin after calving, they had better, uh, they were able to maintain higher condition score. So somehow, right, we don't know that yet, we're gonna investigate the next time we will uh, replicate this study, is that we're having some carryover effects on those, on those counts, right? And we'll try to understand why. But what happened to their product, reproductive performance? Pregnancy rates of those that were born from cows that received pre calving supplementation, they was greater than those that did not receive supplementation. So again, the major reason is because now the control group have in body condition score slightly lower than five. And it's not that much lower than five, right? Okay, it was just a little bit. But that loss, that poor body condition score at the time of calving, decreased their pregnancy rates by almost 10 to 13 percentage points. And we didn't see any differences on monensin. So if you look at this strategy, we, uh, just look at the performance of the counts, which one would you pick? I mean, obviously, you're just going to pick the ones that received supplementation without the monensin, right? Because they had the, the uh, no differences in pregnancy rates and no differences in body condition score because of, uh, until the time of caring, if they were offered supplementation with or without monensin. But when we look at the performance of the calves, again, at the time of weaning, calves born from cows that received supplementation, they are heavier at the time of weaning compared to those born from cows that did not receive, okay? Around 30 pounds uh, difference. But when we added the monensin to the diet of their mothers, the calves that are born from those cows, they were almost 54 pounds heavier at the time of weaning compared to the control group. Monensin is a very inexpensive supplement, uh, feed additive. It will cost you three to five cents a day. For, uh, for 100 days, that would be uh, $5. And look at the difference in additional weaning weight that we have by doing that. So even it, the, the major points of all these slides that I wanted to show you is that well, when cows are in, in, in thin body condition score, Pre-calving supplementation, it's a great strategy to increase their reproductive performance, right? But pre-calving supplementation, it seems that it's leading to better performance of the calves, regardless of the body condition score of the moms. And so far, most of our strategies, they have resulted in better performance beyond of the cost of pre-calving supplementation. So we are repeating this type of studies every year. We are adding different strategies. We're doing a small changes to to progress to try to minimize the cost as much as we can without uh, observing these positive effects on their performance. But the whole, the whole message that I want to show you here is that about fetal program is that we need to change our concept about nutrition of pregnant cows. This, the, for me, this is the most important group in the whole cow calf system because that cow will give you the, a calf and it will tell you the quality of that calf as well. We have a bunch of other data that we have, uh, other studies that I'm not gonna be able to share with you today, tonight, but once, uh, hopefully we'll have more opportunities throughout the year, the rest of the year, and also in the future to share, to talk more about that, okay? But the main results that I wanted to show you about cow nutrition was, was these ones. Now, the last part, and I'm gonna be, try to be quicker here, it's about replacement heifers. Uh, in, Florida, in our center, we focus on getting those cows, uh, heifers calving for the first time around 24 months of age, all right? So we, we want to do that because we want to ma maximize the lifetime productivity to those heifers. So for that heifer to calve in a, uh, around two, two years of age, that means that they have to become pregnant at 15 months of age, which means that they have to reach puberty by 12 to 13 months of age. And the reason is that those heifers, when you're not using estrogen synchronization or puberty induction protocol, they need to cycle at least three times to be sexually mature and have better pregnancy rates. So these data exist for several years and nothing, right? It hasn't changed yet. Is that cows that are bred on their third estrus cycle, their pregnancy rates is about 21% greater than those that are bred in the first estrus cycle. Okay, and here I'm talking about those that are in natural breeding, you're not doing any estrus synchronization, okay? Dr. Brunello will talk more about the estrus synchronization strategies. Um, the, and this data here that I wanna show you is, um, it's a summary of, of three years of study where we were looking at different levels of supplementation. But after three years, what we wanted to do was look at what's the difference in reproductive performance of the heifers 
that, uh, that achieve puberty during the breeding season and those that achieve puberty before, okay? So all heifers achieve puberty at some point before the end of the breeding season. We just divided them between those that achieve puberty during, after the breeding season had already started, and those that achieve puberty before the breeding season started, right? That's our goal. And you can see that the major result here is that pregnancy rates was 87% for those that were that achieved puberty before breeding against 55 for those that were pre pubertal during the breeding season. And not only that, look at the calving distribution of those heifers. Within the first three weeks of the calving season, I have 70% of those heifers that, uh, from this group here calving compared to only 40% of those that achieved puberty during the breeding season. 30% more heifers calving during the first three weeks. And if we extrapolate these results from, from other results in other places of the United States, this is a data with thousands of heifers, right? And uh, I, I believe it was in Nebraska, uh, of heifers that calved during the first 21 days of their calving season, the second 21 day period, or the third 21 day period. Okay? And then they look at the performance of those heifers for their like several generations. So what they saw was the heifers that calved during the first 21 days of their first calving season, they had greater pregnancy rates for the next six generations compared to the other groups. They also weaned heavier calves for the next six generations. And they remained longer in the herd. Right? So you're helping dilute this cost of developing those heifers. So that shows you how important it is to make sure that they reach puberty before the breeding season starts because their reproductive performance uh, outperforms those that uh, achieve puberty during the breeding season by a large margin. Okay, and we, we're going to try to understand a little bit more. So the first strategy that I want to show you uh, is this one. It's called stair step strategy. Uh, and this is something that we tried last year. It worked great. And then we're repeating the study this year. And Dr. Binelli and uh, his postdoc, Thiago Martins, he's help, they're helping us in this study. And we have some great results and I'm gonna show you. This is nothing new. It has been successfully done in other breeds and other locations uh, in um, Midwest, United States, and also Texas. But we, we, our approach is slightly different. People use this SARSAP strategy to decrease feed costs. They, they develop heifers in feedlot and they, they can it has been shown that this strategy here decreased feed costs by 10%. And we don't do that. We have those heifers on pasture. So our goal is slightly different. But the, the concept is, is this. Instead of you having those heifers gain, uh, let's say, a pound a day for the entire developing period, okay, they have a constant average daily gain. What we do is we slow down their growth during the first half of that developing period let's say half of a pound per day. And then on the second half, we provide them a greater nutritional, uh, a, a more dense diet, and we try to boost their growth. When you do that, you actually cause a compensatory gain, which means that those heifers will actually gain more than what you predict. And we should be able to achieve the same final body weight at this time. So why would I do that in a scenario, on a grazing situation? If I'm not going to save on, on feed costs, why would I try to explore this? And the reason is to try to escape the heat stress, right? We know that here, during this first half of the period, most of the producers, they wean their calves July, August, right? And then for the next two months, that's the peak of our, our heat stress, right? A lot of humidity, a lot of water, standing water, very hot for those heifers. And once it dries out, we are able to increase their gain. So what we're trying to do with this strategy is just to escape the effects of heat stress. And, uh, and, and also another uh, factor that helps explain that is when animals are under heat stress, one of the first things that they do is to decrease dry matter intake. Because when you consume their diet, uh, it helps, it produces heat. So the greater the energy, the, the dry matter intake, the greater is their heat production. So by decreasing the amount of supplement during the periods of heat stress, we're decreasing heat production. We're not contributing to the heat stress of these animals. And then once it's dry and also much cooler than before, now we're able to provide, that, provide all that supplementation that we saved during the first half 
and try to boost their average daily gain, all right? It's just a strategy to escape the heat stress. So what we did was we, uh, we did that study last year, we are repeating this year. We had a control group that was supplemented with concentrate at one and a half percent of their body weight for about 100 days before the start of the breeding season. And then we had this star step strategy where we supplemented at 1% for the first 50 days. And then we doubled that uh, for the next 50 days. So total amount of supplementation was offered was the same between those two groups. The only difference is that I provided you did a constant uh, nutrition or last supplementation during heat stress period. And I bump it up when it's light and when it's cooler and it's dry for those habits. After 100 days, we, everybody was uh, submitted to this uh, extra synchronization protocol. They were fed the same amount of concentrate, right, all the way to the end of the breeding season, all right? So what did we see? Just to give you an idea about the effects of heat stress, and everybody's aware of, of how bad it is heat stress in Florida, but this is the THI, the Thermal Humidity Index uh, at all for last year which is an indicator of the level of heat stress in those animals. It accounts for the temperature and the humidity. So, and you have several levels of, of THI that is uh, considered heat stress for animals. So if it's below 75, we consider it to be uh, not heat stress. And if it's above uh, 75, then those animals are, during, uh, are suffering from heat stress. If it's above 84, that means that we are in an emergency zone. That means that those animals can actually die because of overheat. Right, and I'm sure some people have experienced something like that of working those cows during really hot days and some of the animals not being able to, to survive. So what you guys can see is that the blue line is the average THI for those cows, for those heifers from August all the way to November. And we can see that even in November, the average is above the heat stress period. So those animals are indeed with heat stress. But the more important data is this one here, the green line. That shows that for several hours of the day, particularly in August, September, those cows that were in their emergency zone, like extremely high uh, levels of heat stress in those cows. All right, now let's look at the performance data. This is the first 50 days when the control group was fed at one and a half percent of their body weight and, uh, and um, the stair-step strategy was fed at about uh, 1%, okay? we did not see any differences in their average daily gain, which is surprising, right? Because the controls are getting about 50% more feed and still they're not converting that extra feed compared to the stair step strategy into gain, average daily gain. But when we look into their intervaginal temperatures, all right, this is the THI throughout the day. I mean, obviously at night it's low and it dramatically inc increases around eight o'clock and it's really high until about six o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, now, the control group, look at their intervaginal temperatures that was measured every 15 minutes for several days. They had much greater intervaginal temperatures. So what's going on here is what, what we believe is two things, is that first, that extra amount of feed is being wasted because it's generating heat, and now these heifers, they have to somehow deal with that extra heat production and dissipate that, all right? So they're wasting energy intake, uh, the, the intake of energy, the extra intake, uh, energy intake, just to deal with the heat stress. Or in this case here, because they are on pasture, we don't know their uh, pasture intake, the control group, what is it, uh, in order to cope with the heat stress, because they're having more concentrate, they're decreasing their forage intake. So during this stressful time, all the extra feed for the control group was not being converted into average daily gain. Now, the second 50 day period, now you can see that THI is much lower, right? There is not as hot as before. Now we don't see any differences in the supplementation. In this stair steps uh, program, now that they're being fed around 2% of their body weight compared to one and a half of the control, now we do see an increase in their average daily gain. So what we believe in this case here is not just the compensatory gain of that stair step strategy, but also the fact that we, um, uh, and this time that they're not undergoing heat stress, all that extra supplement is being converted into body weight gain. So overall average daily gain of the stair step strategy was about a quarter of a pound per day more for those heifers. Even though we didn't spend any extra amount of feed, 
So total amount of uh, supplementation was exactly the same between those two groups. But overall, virtuality gain was greater in these test steps, right? This really worked perfectly. Right, so at the end of the developing period, those heifers in the stair step strategy, they were about 18 pounds heavy. We didn't see any differences in percentage of those heifers achieving puberty. But look at the final pregnancy rates, and we're repeating this data again this year to confirm that. Heifers that were on that step, stair step strategy, almost 90% pregnancy rates compared to 72 for the control. So we significantly boosted their reproductive performance without increasing their feed costs. And I forgot to mention, but this study was also funded by the Florida Enhancement Board, and I really appreciate their support. This is it's definitely some, a strategy that we are going to uh, continue focusing on for the next few years because it worked really well, and it's something that I think a lot of the producers will benefit here, is try to find nutritional strategies that can help them, those animals cope with the effects of heat stress, okay? Now, the last data that I wanna show you is the frequency of supplementation, uh, and, uh, and I'll try to be quicker. Fre reducing the frequency of supplementation is just a strategy that we can easily apply to reduce feed costs. So for example, if you don't wanna feed those animals every day, and let's say you provide three pounds per day for an entire week, that means that each animal will receive 21 pounds of, of concentrate. If we want to reduce the frequency of supplementation, we just divide that weekly amount by the number of feeding events. And let's say seven pounds per day, seven pounds on Monday, seven pounds on Wednesday, seven pounds on Friday. So it's the same weekly amount between those two groups, but now my labor is reduced to half. The problem with that is that I cause, this, I cause fluctuation on their forage intake and also nutrient intake which leads to a cascade of physiological events in those animals. So there's a lot of fluctuation in um, hormones and metabolites that are associated with energy, metabolism, and also reproduction when we reduce the frequency, okay? And we actually have found that when we reduce the frequency of supplementation, we reduce our, uh, uh, reproductive performance of those heifers, right, compared to those that were supplemented daily. This study that I'm gonna show you is that we try to fix that problem. So we try to fix that problem by increasing the amount of concentrate. So the idea here is that I know that when I reduce the frequency of supplementation, I slow down puberty attainment. But when I feed more supplement, I speed it up. Right? So the idea here was that if someone wants to reduce the frequency of supplementation for whatever reason, they would need to bump it up the amount of concentrate to not have any problem. Okay? That was the hypothesis of the study. This study was done for two years. We just published a Journal of Animal Science, and again, it was also funded by the Florida Cattle Men's Association and I, uh, the Florida Enhancement uh, Board. So I really appreciate their, their support here as well. Right? What did we see? In terms of consumption of supplements, is that something that you, everybody would expect? Those that are supplemented daily, regardless of the amount of supplementation, it took them less than three hours to consume the entire supplement offer. Well, now look at those that are supplemented three times weekly, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday. On those days, it took about 11 hours if they were supplemented at 1.25% of their body weight, and close to 18 hours if they are fed at 175. So why does that matter? The problem is that when we're developing those heifers is during the time of the year that it rains pretty much every day or every afternoon. Right? So in this case here, you have several hours of the day that the supplement is exposed to rainfall. And you can lose some of that supplement that you provide to the scouts just by getting too wet. And also the exposure to wildlife consumption. You have uh, wild animals having access to the supplement that's supposed to be just for heifers. So this is uh, very interesting data that we see is one of the consequences of what happens when you reduce the frequency of supplementation. Now, in terms of performance of the heifers, unfortunately, I have to tell you that it did not work, right? Increasing the amount of supplement did not solve the problem. So again, heifers that are supplemented three times weekly, they have a lower average daily gain than those supplemented daily. So at the start of the breeding season and at the end of the breeding season, they are lighter. We did see last heifers achieve puberty at the start of the breeding season if they're supplemented three times weekly. And that's not just because they gain less, but also because the fluctuations on their supplement intake that leads to, to uh, 
different uh, uh, puberty attainment on those heifers compared to those supplemented daily. And in this study here, after two years, we didn't see any differences in overall pregnancy rates among those cows, but we did affect their calving distribution. Those that are supplemented daily, more heifers calve during the first three weeks of their calving season uh, compared to those that were supplemented three times weekly. All right, 60% against 20 only. So you have 60% of your heifers calving during the first 21 days. All right, so that's a tremendous impact. So sometimes, unfortunately, when we think too much about, about labor, which I know it's important and we want to save some, as much as we can, sometimes those decisions to save on labor is having a dramatic impact on their uh, reproductive performance. Right? Average daily gain overall, mature cows and replacement heifers or steers, it's, it's hard to be impacted when you reduce the frequency of supplementation. It happens in just a few cases. But the negative impacts of their puberty, uh, it happened in all four studies that we published. And also, it seems that it's also an issue for inter, uh, fetal programming effects. So our group is committed to try to find uh, supplementation strategies that require the least amount of labor and still achieve uh, positive responses in terms of their performance. Okay? But it will take time, but every year I want to update you on that uh, research. Now, if you look at the effects of uh, supplement amount, uh, that's very obvious, right? Those that are supplemented on a greater amount, they gain more, so they are heavier throughout their development period. More heifers were cycling at the beginning of the breeding season, 81 against 92%, right? And we substantially increased their pregnancy rates, 83% for those fed at 175 compared to 65%. This difference is more than enough to pay for the extra feed costs. So, uh, in our scenario here in South Florida, using this level of supplementation can be quite successful. And you also see differences in calving distribution. Those that were supplemented with a greater amount, they also can already. Okay, so, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this frequency and amount of supplementation because this is something that we have showed quite a lot. But uh, the whole message that I wanted to show you guys here is just to give you an update of some of the most recent data that we've had developed. And uh, if you are not associated with our Facebook page, please do, because it provides you a lot of the updates that we have, uh, uh, upcoming trainings, field days, and videos, and photos of everything that we're doing. It's a great, great point for us to check whatever we are doing. Okay, and also it has the contact information of all the faculty. So if you have any questions about other topics, please um, let us know, all right? So is there any questions uh, so far? I really appreciate your time. Sorry I went a little bit uh, longer than I would like to. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please type your question here in a, on a group chat and then we can answer it. Or uh, just unmute yourself and then make the question, all right? Hey, Felipe, uh, I'll ask you a question. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I know that, that that was not the the focus of your presentation today. But uh, have you measured any any effects uh, of your strategies on the on the on the next pregnancy? So affecting the the prima pairs the prima pairs animals, the animals the the, the heifers on their second gestation. Yeah, I know that, I know, we, I know that the group worked a lot with that with the early winning strategies in the past. I don't know if if uh, if you have a, a work with that category of animals. Yeah, we, uh, um, you mean for the, the, the this replacement half is getting pregnant carrying for the first time, right? So at ONA, we do early wean 100% of those cows, uh, of the calves of those heifers. So when we do that, we, we change, we mask a lot of any effects of previous treatments, right? So pregnancy rates will be in the 90, 95%, and all of them bring bread early. So any benefit that we could potentially have from those strategies, we couldn't see. But I, if you look into, in a scenario that people don't early wean and, and you have a more challenging scenario, I, I do think it would be some, some, some differences there. But honestly, the only reason that we haven't looked into that is, is because we already wean all the calves. And that, uh, that masks a lot. 